everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and if you're new to my channel, welcome. I'd love for you to subscribe so you get notifications of my new interviews with amazing teachers and my own video blogs. And you do that below. Now, today you're truly in for a treat. You're going to meet the spiritual teacher, Aaron Abke. And Aaron was raised and born as a pastor's son, and actually he worked as a pastor for a year before he left his religion and started to pursue authentic spirituality. And today he's sharing texts like the Law One and the Course of Miracles, uh, especially to his YouTube audience, over 100,000 subscribers on his channel. That's amazing. You should check it out. And he's also one of our masterclass teachers in Wisdom from North membership, where he has a class that's called Spiritual Balancing, and this is based on the law of one. And if you don't want to miss his class, then read all about the membership below. Hello, Aaron. How are you today? Welcome. Hello, Janneke. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. I have been so excited about this because I know or, or discovered uh, the Law of One material uh, six months ago, approximately. And I just felt really drawn to it immediately. And then I found your YouTube channel and I went through video after video. And I was like, I have to share this with my members because we have different classes each month. Uh, so I was so grateful that you said yes and came along and is teaching for us. And I find this material really profound. And we're going to delve into what the law of one is today. But before we do, uh, I know you had a spiritual dramatic awakening when you were 27. Would you like to share what happened and what sort of led you into the work you're doing today? Sure, yeah. I feel like that's probably the, the main catalyst for what caused me to find the raw material because I was really on this um, intense journey to seek for answers for how do I uh, return to that state of consciousness I got to experience for two weeks. And basically what happened was I was just um, in, a, in a state that many people find themselves in in life where you're just kind of slipping further and further down uh, into depression and hopelessness for life and just feeling like everything's meaningless and that suffering for a lot of people becomes a driving catalyst for spiritual seeking. And for me, I, I guess I could say I've always just had like an innate um, like revulsion to suffering. Like I, I detested it. Like this can't be right. I don't believe this is natural. There's got to be an answer for why I'm suffering like this. Um, something in me kind of rejected it as, as an experience. And so I think out of that, maybe intuition, I had an experience one day listening to an Eckhart Tolle lecture where my mind just kind of died for a couple weeks. Hmm. And uh, in that state of having a sort of a dead mind, uh, dead mind means not necessarily that there are no thoughts, but it's the mind becoming devoid of any personal desires and kind of turned inwards, like looking at itself, looking at who is the witness, who is, who is aware. So my mind was in this state of what they call dead mind. And I just kind of experienced two weeks of unbroken bliss and peace and inner silence. And uh, this is, you know, what, what I considered at the time, this must be what enlightenment is. And after two weeks in that state, I started to think, maybe this is my permanent state. Like, maybe this isn't going to go away. And um, I've realized now, looking back in retrospect, that was the first thought of ego returning again, <laughs> taking me out of the present moment, right? Maybe this will be forever. So slowly, the, the old personal conditioning came back online. And I never, I definitely never returned all the way back to the state I was in before of severe depression. Um, but I went back that direction, but there was a new found understanding that liberation is absolutely real, undeniably. So I just experienced this kind of two week free sample of it. And so I had no excuses now to do anything else with my life, but seek how to find that state again. And so on that journey of seeking, I was drawn to a few texts, like you mentioned, A Course in Miracles was one and 
The law of one was the second one. And I feel like these are texts, these sort of channeled works almost have a life of their own. It's like they sort of find you when you're ready for them and they kind of introduce themselves to you and say, hey, you know, I think you're ready to check this out. That's kind of what the law of one did for me. Fascinating. Uh, I want to ask a little bit more about this awakening. Was it like you woke up one morning and just felt bliss or did it happen like in an instant or did it come slowly? Like I've never experienced what you've experienced. So I'm just curious. Yeah. So I, I was working at a, um, I was working at Google at the time in, in Mountain View um, as a personal trainer. And I, I was going up to uh, this little balcony above my gym every day at lunch on my break. And I would just listen to Eckhart Tolle for about 45 minutes to an hour and just kind of stare at the clouds. And it was the only time of my day that I really had peace from my mind. So I, I couldn't wait to get on my break every day. And I'd probably been doing that for like three months or so. And one day I was listening to a lecture from Eckhart where he was kind of um, making light or making jokes about things that the ego says to us and showing how trivial and, and stupid it is. So he would say a phrase and the audience would laugh and then he would laugh and I would laugh. And uh, he was saying things like, if everyone would only be nicer to me, then I could truly be happy. And then he would, ah, 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 and he would laugh and the audience would laugh. And I was laughing each time. And, and at the third or fourth one, he said something in me, I just recognized like, whoa, that's exactly what my ego says all day, every day. Like, yeah, it's just a stupid tape recorder on a loop. And something about that insight, um, I guess I just, I turned inwards and looked inside of my mind so intensely and realized that there was nobody there. Everything I was taking to be me, I'm thinking these thoughts, I am suffering. This I who suffers, I was able to see that it didn't exist. And the way I describe that sometimes is like, it's sort of like I was giving somebody a tour of my mind and walking them around like in a house or something. And I open one door and say, okay, and behind this door is where I am. And so whoop, here I am. And there was nothing in there but empty machinery just running by itself. And I was kind of like, wait a second, where am I? I thought I was in, this is my room. This is where I live, but I'm not here. I just found conditioning. And so that, that insight somehow just blew the doors off of my consciousness. And it sort of was like somebody tied my ego into a broom closet for two weeks it just, it wasn't, really wasn't present. And in the absence of ego, I experienced the self, the true self. Its nature is perfect innocence, perfect peace. It wants absolutely nothing. It just shines as that, that knowing I am. And in that knowing I am, you see it reflected everywhere. Every person reflects I am back to me. And so you sort of lose, um, the distinction between self and other, um, the environment is me, the other people are me, everything I experience is me, like the world I experience is every bit as much me as this body through which I experience it. You just see like, oh, it's all one, it's one dream happening in the one mind of the self and I am that. Wow, wow, what a profound experience. Have you felt sort of that experience or that sense again now that you are working so much with the law of one and spirituality, authentic spirituality? Has it come back? Yeah, you know, it, it wouldn't feel totally accurate to say it's come back because I have, especially through the Course, course in Miracles and the Law of One, putting these practices to work every day it's, it was started off as a discipline. Like I'm just going to reject any thought that other people are separate from me. And as often as that thought appears, I'm just going to say, no, that is me in another body. I am one with that person. That's kind of what Ra teaches in the law of one. And then eventually that practice kind of fell away and it just became a normal perception for me. When I see another person, I just feel this connection, this love for them. And I want their good is as important to me as my own good. 
And through just one little belief, one perception at a time over the last few years, um, it sort of has just dawned on me that, yeah, this has always been my natural state. It's just been obstructed by all these false ideas and beliefs that ego creates. So it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, I've been laying in a hot tub and the temperature slowly has been increasing. And the warmer it gets, the more I'm able to sort of recognize like, ah, oh, yeah, this is how it felt. Yeah, I, I'm remembering this now. So it's been a slow cooking process, I would say. Interesting, because I went to India in 2011 to this ashram, and then they taught us that um, uh, you can have a spiritual awakening or uh, enlightenment or whatever right. you call it in two ways, either through grace or through practice, 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 practice. Yes. And that's so right. interesting. So now it seems like you've experienced both. <laughs> yeah, I think I had a bit of both. Yeah. All right. So let's move into the law of one. For those who are totally new to it, do, would you like to just give, give a, a short introduction to who raw is and what this channeled material is? Yeah. In summary, the law of one is a channeled text from the early 1980s from a group of three people who were a part of a a larger group of, I think around 12 people who were, they were actually um, sort of like UFO researchers, but they were uh, doing that in a very different way than is typically thought of, meaning that they were pretty much solely interested in the philosophy of ETs. Mm -hmm. Not as much like, where do they come from? How do they get here? What's the physics of their UFO craft and things like that? Those are interesting questions and they do ask Ra some of those questions, but somehow through their channeling, um, they, they started to discover like ETs are out there. Obviously we see them all the time, uh, but they are waiting for us to contact them because they honor our free will. And these ETs are very, very advanced in consciousness compared to us. So they don't go around making guttural sounds with their mouths like we do. <laughs> they communicate straight through telepathy, through nonverbal communication. So if we can learn how to channel, we can perhaps communicate with them and receive some kind of contact and learn more about them. So they were doing this for a number of years and getting better at it and having some little contacts here and there. And there was one session one night where actually the only woman in the group who was Carla uh, received contact from an entity that identified itself as Ra. And they knew right away based on the communication that was happening that this is um, this is a genuine contact with an extraterrestrial entity. So they said, okay, let's get uh, some dedicated channeling sessions going. And the, the format they use is one questioner, of course, the channeler, and then a scribe, somebody who's recording and writing down the, the manuscript. And so that was the group that contacted Ra. And Ra basically would only communicate in the question answer format with them. Uh, because they, they, again, really want to honor free will. So they're kind of like, we're not here to present some religion or philosophy to you. Uh, we're just here available to share with you whatever you'd like to know. You go ahead and ask us. And if we feel it's not an infringement of your free will, we'll be happy to answer you. So they just start kind of questioning Ra about stuff. And Ra sort of describes in answer um, what the nature of the universe is. Why are we here? Who are we? What's the purpose of life? Again, these very basic spiritual questions. And the answers, as you could expect, as, as one would expect from a true extraterrestrial, are beyond mind-blowing. But at the same time of being beyond mind-blowing, they're also so incredibly obvious that everyone who reads the Law of One seems to have the same exact response to it, which is like, I somehow knew this already. Like I'm remembering this truth for the first time. Yeah, I'm reading it right now. And with the help of your YouTube videos and the masterclass is really helping me because I'm Norwegian and sometimes it's a bit complex. Uh, the uh, language yes. wise, it's very like, it's almost a bit like royal the way they, they talk. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very scientific. Yeah, yeah. And so they came in the 80s or started communicating with Carla but they've been here before as well, right? And it seems like Carla was in a way, one of the few 
channels that was actually able to channel them. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they were looking for the right kind of contact, which is very important to them. Um, because one of the first questions they ask Ra is like, oh, are you the Ra from Egypt? Right. And they say, uh, yes, we came, I think about 11,000 years ago to the Egyptians. And they actually apparently walked among the Egyptians uh, in their physical form. Well, really they, they're made of pure light so they can sort of materialize any kind of light body they want to through thought. But they, they materialized a light body that resembled the way that their bodies looked when they were in the fourth density evolving on the planet Venus about 2 billion years ago. And when, the, when this was written in the 80s, none of this science was out yet. But in, in September of 2019, a very interesting article came out of NASA, which says that studies find that about 2 billion years ago, which is exactly what Ross says, uh, Venus was the Goldilocks planet of our solar system. It was right in that habitable zone. It probably had oceans and life. And it was in that um, Goldilocks zone for many, you know, a couple billion years or so. So Ra says we are the social memory complex from the planet Venus from billions of years ago. They're now in the sixth density, so they're very, very advanced. Uh, they're no longer living on Venus, or Venus isn't habitable actually anymore. But they, they travel in thought, communicate through thought, through consciousness. And so they appeared to the Egyptians 11,000 years ago to try and give this philosophy of law of one. Uh, because back then they said the Egyptians were a pantheistic society. So they already believe that the sun is a God, the earth is a God, we're all one, you know, those kinds of ideas were normal to them. So in Ra's estimation, it wasn't an infringement for them to come openly and communicate. But on a planet like ours, where we have many different religions and we're divided and a lot of people don't even know if aliens exist, if, if there is a God, that would be very much in their eyes an infringement on our free will. So they've been looking for a new contact who they could communicate their philosophy through that wouldn't distort it and make a religion or a cult out of it. And so it takes a long time for that configuration to appear. And they basically say, we, we identified your group as a, uh, a very uh, acceptable group for us to communicate through. And so that's why we have essentially the raw contact. Wow. Are they alive still or, or one of them, I think, is alive from that group of three? Yes, Jim McCarty. Uh, I've done a few interviews with him on my channel. He was the scribe. Right. And what I found really interesting was that I think they said, I think they said this, that Gaia or Mother Earth is moving into or was moving into uh, the fifth, fourth density in 2012. Right. And it's so interesting that they're saying 2012, and this is channeled in the 80s, and then 2012 happens, and it's all about the Mayan calendar. And I was like, here comes 2012 again. Yes. It's awesome. It was some big cosmic event that we all knew. The Mayans sort of identified it, but no one really had an answer for like, what does this really represent? And I, I love that about the law of one is it gives you a really great answer for that that question of what was that whole 2012 thing about and Ra describes it as the earth's ascension to a, a fourth density vibration and basically a density the densities of consciousness represent um quite literally the speed of vibration of the photon in that density and so the more uh the more dense light is in any particular dimension the more uh the more information there is right light is information the more information there is, the more ability for consciousness to express itself. So as we go up the seven densities, there's more and more ability or capacity for consciousness to express itself, which is why, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth density beings possess abilities in consciousness, like uh, telepathy, uh, nonverbal communication, uh, teleportation, things like that, time and space travel that seem magical to us because we're in these very heavy, dense, third density bodies that aren't, we don't have the hardware for those kinds of abilities yet. In the same way that my dog doesn't have the hardware to talk to me in English or understand what the economy is or things like that. He just doesn't have that available, but consciousness is not limited. 
consciousness is just flowing through these mechan these mediums we call bodies and it's the body that is the filter for consciousness that uh, that dictates what abilities it can express so each density allows consciousness more and more capacity for that so earth moved from third to fourth density in 2012 which means that we as individual entities also have that ability now if we're ready and willing to do the work basically fascinating and where does dimensions come into the picture then? Because so many people are speaking about we're moving into the fifth dimension and that Gaia is in the fifth dimension. And I understood what you said about the density, but what is, why are we then speaking about the fifth dimension? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really fun and extremely difficult concept to talk about. <laughs> what are no, you as, meta <laughs> as metaphysics are, right? Yeah. So, so a dimension, the best way to think about a dimension is it, it is a perspective of the universe, but a perspective also will dictate your experience of the universe. So like the fourth dimension is time. Well, time is just a perspective of the universe, right? Uh, linearity or causality, we could say is time, but it's just a perspective. And so if we have four points, like a square, say that's a fourth dimension. The fifth dimension is the point on top of the square, which makes it into a pyramid, you could say. So the fifth dimensional perspective of the universe essentially transcends time and is able to look at the four dimensions of time through the lens of oneness. Whereas in time, time separates our perception of the universe because there's a subject object, there's past, present, future. So it seems to split off reality into all these different categories. Fifth dimension still is operating in that dimension, but it's not limited by it. It has seen from a higher perspective. And so that fifth dimensional perspective of oneness is equal to the fourth density perspective of oneness. But the density again is the literally the speed of vibration of the photon. So if the photon's going really slow, like second, third density, consciousness doesn't have the ability to have that realization or seeing of the universe until it starts speeding up. The faster it moves, the more information it can take in and it can start to expand its awareness and go, oh, all is one. That's a fourth density or fifth dimensional perspective of the universe. Wow, thank you for explaining that. That made so much sense. <laughs> I'm wondering about this. It's a tricky one. Yeah. So right now we are in the third density, according to Ra, and moving into the fourth. Now, moving into the fourth, can we, can we do this in this lifetime or do we sort of have to wait uh, <laughs> uh, until our next incarnation and then it's going to happen or perhaps in a few incarnations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. In, in consciousness, you can absolutely ascend to fourth density in this lifetime. Um, the, the body we have, the chemical vehicle we have is a third density vehicle because this is, this is still essentially a third density planet. It's just begun its fourth density uh, evolution. So, you know, maybe in many thousands of years, um, as evolution continues, the, the bodies will reflect more and more a green ray or fourth density vibration, which Ra sort of explains becomes more and more um, a chemical slash electromagnetic body or chemical slash light body. So the body will become more and more translucent and more and more um, able to accept, access psychic powers. You know, when we, see, when we see aliens, typically the way they're depicted or whatever, they tend to have much more fragile bodies, sometimes taller, um, almost sometimes transparent looking. And that's because apparently that's kind of what a fourth density body looks like. And as we get to fifth density, the body becomes entirely a light body. So like, as I was saying earlier, you can literally manifest the body with thought at however you want it to appear, kind of like in a dream or something. When you lucid dream, you just create through thought. It's, it's just like that. So we have to have a third density body because that's the, the vehicle we incarnated into, but our consciousness is not limited by the body. So we can 
ascend to the fourth density by, again, having that loving awareness of the universe that all is one, all is myself. And the more we engage with it, as if it is all me, um, the more and more the, the vibrational state of our own consciousness or frequency will in expand and increase into a fourth density frequency. And really that looks like what we call uh, enlightenment or enlightened beings. An enlightened person is somebody who's realized that I am everything, right? And that's what love means. Yeah, I, when I was introduced to this material, I, I sort of came from the mindset that enlightenment, that is sort of the, the goal or the, the top of everything. And then when I discovered I that, it was like, it's just going on and on and on. And that's just like one of those spaces. And it just expands all the time. Yes. It's amazing. And, and when you've been explaining about the different densities and the di different octaves that were sort of the journey of the soul moving through the seven densities, uh, and that's like the musical uh, scales or notes on the scale. And then when we- Musical notes, seventh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we, when we come to the seventh, we're starting all over again in a sense, but from a, from a higher perspective or, yeah, maybe you can just explain it just briefly. <laughs> Because that was yeah like yeah. Uh, it's so after the seventh density. So the seventh density correlates to the crown chakra, and Ra describes it as the gateway density. So it's the last density in this universe or octave. And once you evolve to the eighth density, that's actually the first density of the next universe, of which we can't possibly really imagine what that would be like. And before this universe is another previous universe that leads into this one and so on for infinity, which is kind of mind blowing, right? Yeah. But it's also the only thing that makes sense. We all know the universe must be infinite. No, no capacity for limitation makes sense. So what we call enlightenment, we very much view it as like the finish line, like running across the, the red ribbon of the finish line with your arms up, right? And in a sense, it is because it's the end of the person or the, the separate, the belief in separation, the ego. But really, it's just the beginning of the next phase of your evolution. Ra explains that in fourth through seventh density, there, there is no suffering. There's no, I mean, I think in fourth density, they say there's some what you might call suffering. But they describe it as um, the impatience to be of service to others, like that sometimes we have to take time for ourselves. And the, you know, the zealousness of love is so strong in fourth density that learning patience is as close to what we could call suffering as they experience. So that gives you a kind of an idea of what lies ahead of us. And Ross says that this third density is by far the shortest and the most intense of all the densities. Ra actually says in one passage, there is um, over like a hundred times more suffering present in third density than any other, or it's like a hundred times more difficult because third density is all about what Ra calls the choosing, choosing between the positive or the negative polarity. And we have to choose by experiencing an equal amount of both polarities. So it's not that the, the whole nature of the universe everywhere is this constant fight and battle between the two polarities that we call suffering. So that's actually just a third density experience and your soul will gravitate one way or the other based on all that incoming catalyst you, you experience. And basically you'll keep reincarnating here until you choose. Do I want to be service to self or on the negative path? That's equally valid. The universe will allow that. Or do I want the positive path, which means I have to choose love. I have to get beyond this belief that I'm separate and see myself through oneness and as soon as we get to that state, we are eligible for a fourth density incarnation on a fourth density planet somewhere, or perhaps on earth in a couple hundred or thousand years, you know, we come back here again. But really that, that transition that we call enlightenment, you know, in, in my experience of this state of oneness, really what it feels like is, is more like you are a, a chick pecking at an eggshell from the inside, trying to break out of this belief in separation. And while you're in this eggshell of third density thinking, this appears to be the whole universe, just this cold, dark place. Why am I here? Who's done this to me? And as you peck through that shell, 
and you break out and realize, oh, I'm not that person. I'm not in that shell. You see that actually the whole universe awaits me. Like this is, I've just been born into this universe. This is the beginning of the journey. It's not an ending at all. Yeah, and even scientists are speaking about multiple uh, universes now. So I think it's very interesting in what they're talking about quantum physics and that all possibilities are open and I cannot understand that with my mind, but I believe it actually explains some of metaphysics, actually, quantum physics. Most definitely. I think the more time goes by since the raw material has been written or channeled, um, the more and more that science is proving all of these ideas that Ra lays out back in the 1980s. Hmm. And what I also find interesting is that, uh, well, uh, Ra is a sixth density being then. And um, I think they also say that our higher selves is a sixth density being. Yeah. And then I was wondering about wh why do we speak so much about the higher self from the sixth density? Then we probably have a higher self, self in the fifth density and in the fourth already and in the seventh and in the eighth. Or, and in the first. So I was like curious, what is that higher self? And if that higher self is in the sixth density, perhaps my higher self is raw or your higher self is raw. It could be. <laughs> yeah. Sort of, kind of. It, it's, a bit, um, it's a bit counterintuitive to how normally we think of higher self in the spiritual community. But again, Ra just gives answers to these questions that you go, wow, like that makes perfect sense. And I feel like I kind of knew that, but I didn't. But what, so what Ra says is that we evolve through the densities by polarizing, which is another word for uh, evolving. Um, there's two polarities. You could polarize either one. And so to polarize on the positive path, they call it the service to others path. And now this doesn't, the misconception with service to others is like, okay, so if I want to be a positive being, I sort of become like a, a monk or a Mother Teresa figure. I just go around feeding the poor and the homeless. And that's how I, you know, that's not exactly what service to others means. The positive path, as we've been saying, is the path of oneness. My perception of myself, of the creator of the universe is that it is all one. So the more and more I experience this endless universe, Everywhere I, everywhere I go and everything I experience gives me the touch of oneness in a new light, in a new way. And so to serve another person is another person is to basically worship the creator in them. So it's not that you do it to polarize. It's really the opposite. It's the more you polarize, the more you will find service to others becomes your natural reflection in the same way that it is absolutely natural and effortless to help somebody you love who's suffering. Like if you passed your best friend on the street or your mom or your dad or somebody you love and they had, I don't know, been hit by a car or something, would it take any effort or thought at all to rush to their side and try to help them? Obviously not. That is the experience of the positive polarity as we evolve is that love loves natural desires to shine and give itself. And the more that that happens, the more we are polarizing. And so there comes a point in apparently in mid sixth density where the soul or the consciousness has learned all the lessons available through this path of service to others. And it can't keep polarizing until it kind of goes to the next stage of that. And so Ra explains that the next stage that a mid sixth density soul needs to continue on to keep evolving is to become the higher self, which is essentially when you sort of turn back in time, because in sixth density, there is no time anymore. You can be anywhere at any time you want. You sort of turn back in time and serve as a guide to all your previous lifetimes, all thousands and thousands of them. But that is a very tricky act of service because you're trying to be of service without infringement. So it's like helpful pointers and guide and signposts are okay, but giving answers and giving pointing in directions is not okay because any, any infringement on someone's free will will depolarize you ah. because the negative path polarizes negatively by infringing on free will, by controlling and manipulating. 
So you have to find that balance, right, of being of service in a, in a way that is full of wisdom and authenticity that allows you to gain polarity by being of service and your former selves as well. So it's a, obviously a very advanced form of service that we're not probably really capable of until a mid sixth density stage. Wow, that was so helpful. I get touched. I don't know why I get so touched. It just <laughs> touches me. The truth um, resonates, huh? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, that makes so much sense. Like now I got it because I was wondering about that. So your higher self is you from the future, essentially. Yes. And that's the case for angels as well, isn't it? Because I always thought that angels were something like another department. <laughs> exactly, and another department. I lived on Earth and, and There's I was- no departments in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so what are angels uh, according to Ra? Well, Ra doesn't really say what angels are, I don't think. I don't think they talk about angels specifically, but the whole idea of the light body really kind of answers those questions, mm -hmm. especially for someone like me who grew up, grew up in religion. Anytime there's a writings in the Bible or any ancient spiritual text that talk about an angel visiting somebody, every single time it's a, a being of light, right? An angel of light appears and the countenance is so, is so bright, the person can barely stand to look upon it. Well, Ra says, starting in fourth density, we, we start to become evolution, like literally nature evolves into a light body where the, the chemical vehicle is now pure electromagnetic energy. And that is what, that is the filter that consciousness is funneling into. And so pure electromagnetic energy is much less limited than a, a physical meat suit is, right? So my ability to move through time and space is, is dramatically increased as a light body. So in my estimation, ain't what we call angels are just higher density beings. They're beings like us who are just at a higher stage of evolution. Makes sense. Uh, has Ra said anything about 2020 and 2021? Or was no? Unfortunately not. <laughs> Would love an explanation on that. But I guess it's part of the whole shift into the fourth density problem. Yes, yes. They do they do touch on that idea that as you know, it's it's the same way that we as individual people uh expand our own consciousness. We have to do shadow work. We have to meet those parts of us that we've hated or resented or not forgiven. We have to meet them with love and acceptance and allow those energies to express themselves out of the body. Anything that isn't met with love immediately is trapped energy in the body. And that will, those energies get trapped in the chakras, in the lower three uh, human chakras, we could say. And the upper four, starting at the heart chakra, are the spiritual chakras. And we don't have access to those until we balance and cleanse out the lower three chakras. Because it's just like a hose. If you kink a hose, the water can't flow through. So if one of your chakras is kinked, that prana isn't able to flow up to the upper energy centers. So Ra calls, well, actually, another entity that they channeled named Quo explained that it's um, the heart is basically has two components, which is the outer courtyard, they call it, and the inner sanctum. The outer courtyard is where we meet our shadow side, all, of, all the traumas and unprocessed pain. And we have to meet that with love and forgiveness to access the inner sanctum, which is the center of oneness, which opens up the awareness of the creator in all things. So really, you know the heart chakra is open because it doesn't take effort on your part to see others as one with you. It's just, it's almost the opposite. It's like you can't remember how it felt to think that they were separate from you. And speaking a bit about, you know, um, yeah, healing, uh, you spoke a lot about that in the uh, masterclass, spiritual balancing of the en energy centers. Now, yeah. um, I think I remember that uh, they speak about the masculine energy as wisdom and the feminine as love. Is that right? Um, yes. I, I believe that they do touch a little bit on the masculine and feminine, but they mostly touch on fourth and fifth density. Um, fourth density is the density of love. Fifth is the density of wisdom. Um, you have to learn the ways of love before you can learn the ways of wisdom. 
And uh, the, the negative entity basically flips that. They, they skip over fourth, the fourth chakra uh, and they, they start learning the ways of wisdom first because they, they basically see love as useless and pointless. Um, I want to control and, and manipulate others to my will and my favor. So that takes um, basically the, the powers of manipulation is what they learn first. So if you don't learn love first, that's, you're going to distort it, right? So the feminine is love in the classic sense of when we talk in spirituality, the feminine is the, the pure intuitive. We sometimes refer to it as like emotional energy. It doesn't, um, it has no will of its own. It's totally selfless, kind of like a mother's love, right? It's totally selfless, no thought to itself. And then fifth density represents the masculine um, archetype of the creator, we could say which is light or illumination, which we could call wisdom to know, to understand. And that's where we're now learning on the positive path. What are the most wise, efficient ways to be of service in love? Because in, in, in fourth density, there can be a very um, a common approach to service as like martyrdom, like almost a bit of an overzealousness, which is very beautiful and seen as holy and sacred from a fifth density perspective, but it's also seen as maybe a bit of foolishness or like not the most efficient way to be of service. So fifth density learns how to channel that um, boundless energy of love that shines in all directions, how to channel it into um, the most efficient possible way of putting it to use, we could say. And that's why- and that's feminine masculine. Right. and. It is that also why they call the creator love light? Yes, love and light. Kind of the nature of the creator. So we could say the creator has a feminine archetype, which we experience as love, and a masculine, which we experience as wisdom. And then I was wondering about these wanderers. That uh, is the expression of star seeds. Uh, in the Masakas, we talk about the different uh, stages of the, uh, or the different density, uh, the evolution of the soul. And I feel, well, from what I ha have understood it, you talk about, or they talk about the evolution of, of the soul on the planet, uh, on our earth. Now, what about star seeds that come into this earth? Like, where do they fit into the picture if they've had other evolutions on, on the other planets? Yeah. So when it comes to evolution, what we're really talking about is reincarnation, right? Um, our, our soul um, plugs itself into uh, mind, body, spirit units over and over and over and over because our soul is formless. It has no objective form to it at all. It's pure spirit. So it needs a form to localize itself into so it can move through time and space and have experiences of self and other and the creator can learn about itself. So on this trajectory of reincarnation and evolution, you can't skip steps because it just, it's impossible, right? Like you, like a second grader can't skip to eighth grade and expect to like pass algebra one. Like it just doesn't have the capacity yet, but an eighth grader can go back to second grade to be a tutor if that makes sense. And that's kind of what a star seed is or a wanderer is. Um, but the, the key difference is when, when, when a soul decides to return back to a third density planet, let's say I'm a, I'm a fifth density being, I already did my third and fourth density millions of years ago. But in the fifth, in any density after third, there's no veil of forgetting. So we have total access to all of our previous lifetimes, all the memories, we know that we're a soul on a journey. We know all is one. In third density, we have the veil because we're here to choose polarity. So we can't know we're, what game we're playing. It has to be a totally raw, authentic choice. So if you decide to go back to a third density world, where again, the catalyst is like a hundred times greater, there's a huge risk and reward factor there. The, the reward is because there's so much more catalyst in the third density lifetime, the ability to polarize is dramatically different, is dramatically increased. But there's also the chance that it won't go the way you wanted it to go and you could make some bad decisions and gain some negative karma. 
that might set you back a little bit. So for positive souls, they really want to make sure they feel confident about their vibration of like, no, I'm a fifth density being. I got this. Like I'll, I'll remember the ways of love. I will remember my true nature and I can be of service. And if you can, then yes, you're going to polarize a lot. So in this period of Earth's history, Ra explains, we are at a stage where our planet's moving to fourth density. And that happens because of the sum total of the collective consciousness. So when Earth has made its, you know, 25,000 year cycle, it's, Ra says, it's just like the ticking of a clock. Every 25,000 year diurnal cycle, the earth is eligible to be magnetized to uh, the next density of vibration. If the collective consciousness has reached that already. So apparently 2012 was the ending of that diurnal cycle, which the Mayans predicted. And it was our third cycle of 25,000 years. And we finally reached a stage where 51% of the earth's collective was on a loving vibration, a service to others nature. And so the earth went and magnetized to the fourth density. But in order to help that process, to ensure that this becomes a fourth density positive planet, apparently Ross says lots of wanderers will incarnate on these planets that are coming up for graduation to kind of tip the scales, right? Because every single person is adding to the collective vibration. So like my healing becomes the world's healing in a sense. The higher my vibration is, the sum total of the earth goes up a bit. So it's obviously a tiny percentage on an individual basis. But if thousands and thousands of us start polarizing and, and evolving, we can make a noticeable difference in the earth's vibration. And that's felt on a planetary scale. So a lot of souls apparently were incarnating wanderers, higher density souls incarnating here to bring their native vibration to help boost us and help us graduate because apparently we were kind of on the precipice of not being eligible. And Ross says that it looks like it's going to work. We're going to actually be a fourth density positive planet. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. Uh, what, what is your uh, take on other channel material like uh, Abraham and Bashar and the difference in a sense, like I've followed them as well uh, because uh, um, Abraham is speaking a lot about the law of attraction and um, Law One is also speaking about it, but sort of in a different way. And I know you've spoken a bit about this, and I, I think it has to do with the way also uh, the channel uh, channels that um, uh, uh, what's her name, Carla. She was a, in yeah. a complete trance, while mm -hmm. Esther Hicks, she's more like you know, very conscious, or it seems like she's very conscious. Uh, so what is your perspectives on these different mm. channelings? Yeah, I've thought a lot about this because there are a lot of channelers who are um, pretty much, you know, conscious while they're doing it. And there's different forms of channeling, but it's important to know like what's actually happening when someone's channeling. Okay, what's not happening is it's not a game of telephone. So an ET is not like, say this next. And then the, so I'm saying this next, it's not what channeling is. Beings that communicate through telepathy, they don't even have a verbal language. They've left that alone, you know, millions of years ago, probably. So they communicate purely based on feeling, intuition, knowing, in, impressions. Uh, it's, it's way beyond words. It's way more accurate than words. I can basically translate my exact state of consciousness to you. So you know exactly what it feels like to be me right now. I can show you how I'm feeling right now, um, how I'm processing something. And it's, it's really a wordless thing. And the channeler is sort of doing its best to use words that seem to describe what the intuition is the best. So in a, the, the benefit of a trance state is that the entity being channeled is doing all that work for you. And so in the law of one, Ra is choosing the words from the English language that they believe are the most accurate possible word available to give this concept in the least distorted way possible. And already when you put language to something, it's already distorted because whoever's listening is using what they know of that concept or that word and what I think it means. So it's already from their perspective, very much muddied, but 
they're just doing the best they can with the, the language we have. So that's why when you read the law of one, there's, it's very dense. There's very big words all the time. And a lot of the words that Ra uses, they had to look up. They have no clue. I've never even heard this word before, but they open the dictionary later. They're like, oh, there it is. Okay, here's what it means. So they actually put a lot of footnotes throughout the law of one of like, this word means this. Because Ra was trying to give the least distorted transmission they could. So an entity like uh, Esther Hicks, who's channeling Abraham, um, it, it may actually just be sort of their, their own higher self they're channeling. It may be an entity named Abraham. But because they're not in a trance, they are doing that work of what words do I think best describe the impressions I'm receiving. And so because of that, you know, Rob was very clear of like, we're not here to like give you answers and tell you stuff. We want you to ask us and we'll give answers if we don't think it's infringement. Then you see entities like Bashar, Abraham, like giving off long speeches and you're like, oh, are they breaking the rules or what? And I think what's really happening is they are giving impressions to these answers and the channeler, be it Esther or um, I can't remember the guy's name who channels Bashar. Daryl Lanka. That's right. Yes, uh, Daryl, he, he's doing his best to put words to those impressions. So there's kind of a difference there a little bit. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's important not to like uh, read everything like literally when it comes to channeling. Also, uh, because I've always been thinking about uh, my coffee maker and with a filter that a channel is a filter, uh, especially when they are. Yes. Uh, I haven't seen that many channelers in trance. So that is something different right. when they are like uh, conscious and, and present. I, I do look at it as a filter in the sense that, uh, yeah. Uh, and it does take training. Oh yeah, lots of practice. Yeah. A Course in Miracles, what would you say are the similarities and the differences? Uh, now we're moving into, we're at least we're recording this before Christmas. So we're moving into the sacred time where some astrologers are saying that Christ consciousness is more available. So, yeah. uh, and from what I have understood, A Course in Miracles is based on the Christ consciousness teaching in a sense. So do you have any similarities you can, you can speak about with these two texts? Yeah, I, I like to describe the texts. Um, a Course in Miracles is a non-duality text taught through the Christian language because non-duality is, um, it's impossible to describe what non-duality attempts to describe with words Again, we can just sort of point to that to that reality, the, to the non-dual reality with words, but it's really beyond words. And so almost sometimes a better approach is to use a medium that isn't so literalistic to more make metaphorical, symbolic representations of what we're talking about so that the mind doesn't get too obsessed with the words, but can sort of look beyond the words to what the words point to and get an intuitive understanding of this, these ideas being put forth. And so to me, that's the power of the course is that it, the course is like so brilliant in the way that the entity channeled it, dictated it because of the language it uses. If you are not at a certain stage of consciousness of evolution, you'll read the course and it's absolute gibberish. It's total nonsense. It makes no sense at all. I have no clue what this is even talking about. Um, moving on. And so that way it's not infringing on your free will by giving you answers beyond what you're capable of at this point. But a lot of people say when you're ready, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. The course is very much that way because you'll read it when you're ready and go, you might not even understand it, but something in you will go, wow, this book is remarkable. Like it's putting forth something that is making my, my heart is jumping on the inside, resonating to it. And so when you get to that point, when you're drawn to the magnetism of the book, I think you just can't get away from it. You keep reading it and you keep reading it. And slowly these, these ideas of like the son of God, the father, Holy Spirit, salvation, you start to get an idea of what they're really talking about, which really is kind of what the law of one lays out in terms of how we get to fourth density. 
So to me, the law of one is kind of like, um, it gives you the map of like, here's where we are. Here's what the universe is. Here's where you're starting. Here's where you want to get to. And the A Course in Miracles is like the tour guide who takes you through the map in, in reality and shows you how to navigate through it to get to the fourth density. Fascinating. And I saw an interview with you where you spoke about Jesus that uh, you, you talked with another guy and you were uh, reflecting what, about whether Jesus was in the fifth density right now. Uh, continuously, uh, continuous sing, uh, continuing his uh, evolution as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they ask Ra about that in one of the sessions. And they say, where is this entity? Um, Ra, Ra defines the entity we call Jesus. Apparently his real name in the first century was Yahushua. Uh, a different variation of Yeshua in the Hebrew language. And they say, where is this entity now? And, and Ross says, um, the entity known as Yahushua is now learning the ways of fifth density. So apparently Jesus was a fourth density wanderer who came back to the planet, you know, 2000 years ago, whose sole mission was, I want to be a martyr. I want to be a catalyst. Because again, in fourth density, martyrdom is like very, I don't want to say popular, but it's, <laughs> there's no thought of the self, right? I, I will gladly give my life. And so Jesus knew, like, I can be a catalyst to help this planet evolve to fourth density by living and embodying and demonstrating fourth density consciousness. We call it Christ consciousness to the world. And of course, in this time and place, I'm going to do that in. They're going to they're going to murder me for that for, for sure. Like, I'm going to be crucified by the religious leaders of the day because this is against what they teach. But that's fine. That's that's a way I'm going to polarize myself. So apparently Ra says Jesus was a very late fourth density soul who this was maybe, maybe his last kind of um, last hurrah in the fourth density was to do this. And now he's in the fifth density, learning the ways of wisdom. And I think that's very interesting because when you read the Course in Miracles, it's very much a classic fifth density text. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you want to get an idea of what, how a fifth density being communicates and thinks and how they would speak to you it's very much a course in miracles so i find those two uh synchronicities very interesting it makes a lot of sense because the first time i've heard somebody suggested to me when i've been philosophizing my whole life with friends and stuff like that and someone said one if jesus is an extraterrestrial and i was like that's it <laughs> i just really resonated with that thought yeah and uh, i was very young it just stuck with me uh the last quest oh. question i want to ask you that i've been wondering about reading this material is when we are moving through these densities uh, and you probably said it but i clearly it hasn't gone in uh, we're moving through uh, these different densities uh, and I'm a third density being right now, like as Janneke. But then when I die, when I go over to the other side, what am I then in a sense? A am I merged? B because I've interviewed many with near-death experiences that are saying that they're, they felt one with everything. And it seems like all of a sudden they were back with sores. Uh, so it seems like they lost or some lost their individuality, some didn't, but they felt one with the light. So then it seems like all of a sudden they have moved up the scale in a way. So who are we? Who are we when we die? And then we go back again, we reincarnate again and again, but like, where are we going when we die? I'm like, I don't understand what uh, level I will be at then. Yeah. Makes sense. The best analogy would be to think of um, physical reality like we're in now as like a video game that um, the creator is playing. And this is one of the video game characters and you're one of them. So the creator splits its, in a sense, splits its consciousness off into in, you know, infinite amount of individual fragments. We call them souls. And each soul starts at the same exact place. Um, one analogy I'll use is like Play-Doh. We all come from the same pile of Play-Doh and we get separated into little individual pieces. And then we all start our journeys 
and we go along hundreds and thousands of different lifetimes and those different lifetimes mold us into different shapes and figures and characters but we all of the same essence the same the same clay or plato and so when we when a physical incarnation ends we return back to um our astral state or really we are in our astral body is inside the physical body now and when we dream at night we're basically it's our astral body that's traveling through the dream world so when the astral body is no longer being localized into the physical body be it through death or out of body projection or something then we're not under that veil of forgetting it's the the physical brain the physical meat suit is under the veil so as long as we're in this physical vehicle, we don't have access to all these memories and knowledge of who we are and where we come from. So when somebody dies, they go back to that state. They can step out of the video game, you could say. But to continue polarizing, apparently, um, it's really hard to gain spiritual polarity uh, in the astral without a physical body because you already know all the answers to the test. So it's like, how much learning can you do if you have all the answers already? You can't. So we have to, the soul has to incarnate into a physical body and play the game. And so really just like a kid playing video games on the couch, who's getting all enthralled in the game and throwing the controller and screaming and punching the pillow and the frustration. That is how we behave as third density beings. When we think I am this body, I am this person. And this world is so cruel to me. When we're identified as this body, we suffer just like the kid playing the game suffers when he's too identified with the game. And an enlightened being, you could say, is somebody who's able to play the video game. And when the character dies or they lose the level, they don't get all triggered. They just restart. And they're totally at peace. They're not identified as the character. So they can enjoy the game, play the game, but not suffer from the game. That's kind of a fourth density state of consciousness. So on the other side of this veil, we have the knowledge and the memories but we need to step into the video game to keep leveling up, if that makes sense. Right. So that means that uh, I won't merge with the light and become, you know, the light. I, I will still be on my level on the other side, uh, but have all the answers because I just interviewed even Alexander many years ago. And I believe he said, I, I knew everything, but like you're saying, like, yeah. you know, all the answers to the test, but that, probably doesn't mean that you are on the in the sixth density still right 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 yeah and that's why a lot of people who have near-death experiences will have their life review and you know you are the judge of your own life review based on the way you react and interact with those memories if there's a lot of regret and unforgiveness we call that karma you will see all the people you wronged and you hurt and you betrayed and in that environment of perfect oneness, you're, you're aware of your perfect oneness. It's so difficult to stomach the things we do out of the belief in separation. How could I have been so blind? How could I have forgotten who I was? I experienced all the pain I've ever caused. And out of that, there's this natural, you know, love has this natural impulse. Like, let me go back. I got to make it right. I got to forgive. I got to love. That is the desire of the soul to evolve and polarize. And so you can spend a long time apparently in the astral, um, sometimes healing from your previous lifetime. If you had a very traumatic death or, or incarnation, Ross says you'll, you'll spend a lot of time in the astral plane healing from that so that you can feel ready to go back into the game again. And some souls are like, put me back in right away. I want to go right back. And there's, there's a whole spectrum of differences, but yeah. You're, you're only at the density density in the physical incarnation. It's the, it's the body, it's the meat suit or light body that is in the density. Consciousness is, itself is, is unlimited. I'm just getting so many new insights right now. Like I'm <laughs> sure the way I've seen things. It's like, oh, now I get, got something new. Uh, wow. I love when I click. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can explain it. I need to like find words for it. So that will come. Yeah. In video. But wow. Thank you so much, Aaron. This, this has been profound and so interesting. Thank you so much for showing up today. And 
I wish you all the best with your beautiful work. And I'm excited about we're going to have a Q&A with the members in February 2021 as well, when they get to me uh, to ask uh, their questions to you. So I'm excited. So thank you so much. Thank you as well, Janneke. I've had a blast and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. And thank you for watching everybody. And if you don't want to miss this class, you can find everything about the membership in the link below. Thank you so much for watching. Much light from the US and Norway. Bye-bye.